Hello, I'm Pam Hoffman, Everyday Spacer. I'm Jeff Miller, 2049 Outfitters. At Everyday Spacer, we show regular folks how to personally and directly participate in space exploration, science, and astronomy. We're here on Friday nights at 9 p.m. Pacific Time, 12 midnight Eastern Time, and 2 p.m. on Saturday in Queensland, Australia. We are broadcasting live from Thousand Oaks, California. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, you know, our sample trophy arrived yesterday and we wanted to be sure it was a good quality for our winners from the last show you may recall that it was our first annual everyday spacer awards we want to recognize chris sobrowski david renicky wally funk and pranvera heiseni we'll tag these folks in a post soon and we're looking for an address to send their prize to them tonight's guest is mike simmons he's returning um I had a whole lot. We had a whole lot of different ones for that, but we'll we'll be back in eight point three seconds. Astronomy for Equity supports astronomy in marginalized communities. A4E encourages outreach astronomers to make programs more inclusive and promotes the use of astronomy to introduce science education in developing countries. Astronomy enthusiasts and teachers are everywhere, and astronomy is the most accessible science for introducing all of the STEM fields, science, technology, engineering, and math. Astronomy for Equity programs use the universal nature of astronomy to bring mainstream opportunities to isolated and marginalized communities. We are delighted to bring Mike Simmons back to the Everyday Spacer Friday Night Show again tonight. Mike, give us an update. What are you up to now? Well, yeah, you guys just did my whole spiel for me. Oh, <laughs> I'm sure so, you have more. Oh, good night, yeah. Mike. <laughs> <laughs> so... Uh, yeah, there is a lot going on. So we, we, we've we launched, we have a new website, we have a, our first campaign that has been uh, very successful. We have some new things going on. I, I can share some pictures with you about the idea, then if people have questions or something, they can ask about it. But, you know, <clears throat> the main thing is that astronomy, we're used to it. Uh, you guys and me, and we go out with our telescopes, we do outreach and, and you know, that's all cool. But there are people everywhere that are fascinated by, and they don't have the access that we do. And they should, stars are for everyone, right? So, uh, and, and they're up there for everyone to see. So uh, let me show you a few things. And I think this will <clears throat> be of interest and it'll get the conversation going. Uh, there we are. So, you know, most people never look through a telescope. They don't know what the stars are or know that they can even see the planets naked eye. This is a line. You see that going all the way to the back there and then curving around and going off. Yeah. The left. This is in Nepal. <clears throat> Bring a telescope to a place like this and this is what you get. Wow. Every Astronomy is everywhere. Uh, although these are girls at a school in uh, Kabul, Afghanistan, and astronomy is in danger there. I'm talking to a woman who's... Uh, He's part of an astronomy group in uh, Western uh, Afghanistan near the border with Iran. And uh, they're having trouble now teaching science, teaching astronomy that may conflict with the ultra-religious fundamentalists who run the country now. But these girls had a chance to just look at the sun. You know, most people have never looked at the sun. I mean, it's up there, but you don't look at it, right? So. Right. These are just solar glasses and gives people a chance to look and say, well, there's our close star. Yeah, yeah. and you really want to be careful. We, we always want to add the do not look directly at the sun. You want to have some type of solar, you know, basically, uh, what, what's the it's certified? It's certified for solar observing, basically. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, that's really important. And these were supplied from the U.S., so... We know that they were safe. Now, when I say astronomy is endangered, you know, some places are a little more dangerous than others. Uh, I love this shot. This is from uh, Iran, a uh, place I've been to quite a bit. Uh, this is not this area, but they had a star party there. Wow. And uh, they they had some guests from Iraq, from Kurdistan, that I didn't introduce when I went to, to uh, that part of Iraq. And 
they took this uh, long exposure with the guard that was there. The reason for this, <clears throat> this is something I've never seen in the country and I've been all over, but this is along the drug trade route from Afghanistan, which is opium poppies that are made into heroin and so on. Wow. So there are a lot of drug smugglers and that's not a good area for anybody, any place. Uh, but, and then we have, okay, so here are a couple of things, just, just to mix things up a little bit. How many people out there know that in astronomy and the rest of the world is all young people? And this is in the Philippines, and this is typical. This is typical of most of the world. It's not us old guys like me. It's a mix of all kinds of people, uh, and especially young ones. And in Iran, <clears throat> here's another thing astronomy and other sciences are dominated by women. I didn't think about this until I came back and uh, after taking this picture in a student observatory in Northern Tehran, but there's only one boy there who I'm still in touch with, by the way, is now in, uh, in college. And uh, so it, it, it's, it's very different than most people realize. The other thing is too, this is typical. This is in Rwanda. They're doing astronomy with what they've got, which is not very much. As you can imagine, they don't have any biology labs. They don't have chemistry labs. They don't have physics labs. Oh. They have the astronomy lab. You know, if if they're outside of a city, they got a better astronomy lab than we do. Oh, yeah. And uh, <clears throat> so that's why it's so useful for introducing science. Here in Ethiopia, that vehicle in the back is a, an astro bus. And uh, they bring astronomy to the people like here in the classroom. Um, so I don't know where in Ethiopia they are here. I've been to uh, Addis Ababa, the capital, and that's, that's, that's pretty well off. But, and this is one of the things now, as you mentioned, I help people in developing countries because they can then introduce STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math, to students using astronomy because it touches on everything, right? You can hardly think of a science that isn't touched by astronomy that you can't right. use that way. And everybody loves it. So that that's what they're doing here. But one of the projects I have in mind, uh, maybe it'll be next year before we get this going, is the people in Ethiopia are doing this with a bus. There are people in Ghana. There's the Galileo mobile that, of the IU that's been around in many places since it started in 2009 in the International Year of Astronomy. And there, there are amateur astronomers everywhere. You give them this idea and tell them this is how you do it, they'll do it. You know, you obviously need some funding in Ethiopia as well, supported in astronomy. They've got observatories and space agency and so on. <laughs> so now, here is something that kind of looks typical. A bunch of kids they happen to be sitting on the floor and they're having a good time. And you can see it's, it's astronomy that they're doing there. And this is the science lab. These are IDP, uh, internally displaced people, the refugees from their homes in Northern Nigeria, where Boko Haram you might've heard of. Yeah. Particularly bad fundamentalist group. Uh, and they're sitting inside of a container. You can see it in the back there. Uh, There's a typical scene here with the kids and everybody wants to take a look. That shipping container in the back, that's the STEM lab. And they use astronomy. Wow. That's one that I've helped before. Uh, this group in Nigeria is incredible. <clears throat> Brilliant people. I mean, they, they just don't have the opportunities that we do, but they are passionate. And these exist everywhere. I'm in contact with people around the world all the time. So it's uh, this is one that we'll be supporting uh, before long for them to uh, expand the things that they're doing in the refugee camps. Uh, here's something most people don't know about. You guys know about this, Astronomy yep. for the Blind. Yep. You guys know about it. Okay. Well, you're well informed, so I'm not surprised. Uh, <clears throat> I'm not sure where this picture was taken, but these are blind students who get a chance to feel what everybody's talking about with the moon. And uh, we also have uh, these students in um, India. There are 2D uh, things like books. There are 3D things. You know, they're just as interested as us. And astronomy, it's multi 
wavelength and many different kinds of things. So it makes sense that there are many ways that you can see this because, you know, we're, we're looking at pictures taken by Chandra X-ray telescope. We can't see X-rays. They convert yep. it into something we can see. Some great right. converted into something you can feel. In fact, Chandra, I know somebody at Chandra who does this and they make, uh, they do a lot of stuff in <clears throat> uh, others in NASA. So I'm, we're starting a program, something I've always wanted to do just in Astronomers Without Borders is there was just too much going on. And now I've narrowed down the focus to these things. So we've got a group, we've got people, including somebody in, from Space Telescope, that's Hubble and, and J. West, that do the... Uh, 3D models of galaxies and stuff like that. And other people who are doing astronomy outreach for the blind, some of them are experts, some of them have just been trying to do it on their own. But I know from going around the world and speaking to people everywhere, they're really interested in doing this. They want to include other people. I mean, it's a thrill, you know, we're out there doing outreach because it's uh, just, you know, you get a thrill from exposing people to these new things. You want to share the universe with them. And it's just as cool for the people there that, that can't do this. So um, we're starting a group that's going to be bringing people together. It'll be a small community. Once it, it gets larger, we'll have a, a thing where people can go in and, and uh, be a part of this community and learn what they can do. Because... Uh, <coughs> um, and Dave, Dave has a great comment there. Thank you, Dave. We'll be in touch, maybe. Um, so uh, it, it, it's not, the problem is not a lack of resources. The problem is a lack of distribution. Because mm -hmm. I've been in the IE working group for accessibility and inclusion, equity and inclusion. I forget which words. But, you know, it's the whole idea that everybody's for astronomy. And, and uh <clears throat> There are tons of resources. There are dozens of things on the website. Nobody knows about them. And the other thing is not that many people are going to go take these things and figure out how to do it themselves. But you get a group together and everybody talks about it and says, try this. And they go do it. They come back and they give their feedback. And that's that's how we work. You know, that's how we do things. Yeah. So it's like a little club or workshop. But there, it's it's everywhere. You know, it's online. It's a spot like what we're doing right here, but it could they could be anywhere in the world. Oh, here's another. This is something most people never heard of. This is a planetarium show for the blind. Oh, and wow. This was made for the International Year of uh, Astronomy in 2009. Um, I produced the English version. It just hasn't been uh, distributed. It was made in Spain uh, at the University of Valencia. And this is something that people could do and they, you know, they get some idea what everybody else is, is talking about. Uh, there are resources like this. We're going to start getting out there too. NASA is too, but uh, you know, we have, obviously NASA has more reach than I do, but they don't reach the outreach astronomers and things like that. Yeah. And they have captions, um, uh, audio, alt text and things like that. Um, for the new J West images, so everybody can find out oh, what it's all yeah. about. Very cool. Yeah, and uh, <laughs> David, you know, <laughs> there are people like Dave everywhere on the planet. Everywhere, I've seen very active astronomy clubs that don't have a telescope. Oh, they're just they're just doing it because, like, every you know, it's like John Dobson used to say when he. He looked through a telescope he's, the first time he said, uh, everybody's got to see this. And that was his life's goal to get everybody to see it. He said, nice. we had a million telescopes. Everybody could look through a telescope. But you know, we don't have a million telescopes. But there are people like Dave everywhere on the planet. Yeah. Everywhere. And they're just waiting for a chance to do this. They love it. So let's see. I've got just a couple more. This is our most recent thing. This is an astronomy club in a middle school in Libya. For the young people who've grown up with uh, with war and then ISIS and political unrest, <clears throat> and this is an astronomy club that they're in uh, doing. We had uh, this is actually after a program we did where I had an astronaut Nicole Stott. Uh, as you can see, it's mostly girls. There are boys too, but these apparently maybe they're girls' schools. I'm not sure. And so we're raising money for um, these five astronomy clubs in five different cities across Libya. They have everything. They have 
a national organization of uh, outreach astronomy. It has 700,000 followers on Facebook, you know, all over the Arab world. Uh, that guy that's in there talking to that girl, he's from the Ministry of Education. So they're supporting. They've got everything they could possibly need, but they don't have telescopes. And uh, we just hit our goal for four of them. We, we couldn't get a fifth one because of the supply chain issues. Now we can get a fifth one. It's very expensive because they have to be shipped over there. That's very expensive. But uh, otherwise, you know, we're going to get these things and get them to them. And this, <clears throat> we have a new blog that was just put up of one of these girls. They, and these, you know what? We had this astronaut who, who talked to them. Nicole, she's a wonderful person. Uh -huh. Five times or something. And, and the guy organizing all this stuff in the national organizations, the last time they had a visit from an an astronaut was Yuri Gagarin. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> so talk about no opportunities. But these guys, I, I'll tell you, you see the stories about them and what it's going to be like when they finally get to look through a telescope for the first time. They know plenty about astronomy. But so it's just, so we're, we created a stretch goal and we're going to get that fifth telescope. And then we'll work on other ways of getting additional telescopes and resources. We'll move on to Nigeria for the refugee kids because how can you not help refugee kids when you see a picture like that? But we need, um, oh, I forget how much we have left that we need to get there. What does it say? We have 82%. So, oh, you have to get up to 3,200. Even going by ship, which takes two or three months, oh, it geez. takes hundreds of dollars to, to get the, the scopes over there. <clears throat> People sometimes said, too, like I took a bunch of stuff to Iraq and Kurdistan when I went there one time. I had three gigantic cartons stuffed with stuff, including a, an LX 208 inch, you know, the, oh. and just a bunch of stuff. And, uh, you know, people say, well, why don't they just order it online? Well, first, they don't have credit cards. And if oh. they have credit cards, it's internal, they can't use them. And if they did, and they had them, in this case, the group had money, they had $800 for a telescope. Really great guy sold his LX 200, about eight inch for, for, to him for 800 bucks. He says, I'll take it and he send it over. And uh, <clears throat> so, uh, and if they did have an ability to ship them in, they get stolen. They'll never get to the people. Getting things through customs and, and everything is a problem. And Dave's got a great comment that he gave him 50. Uh, reflectors and that is exactly what I started with to a Tesco four and a half inch mm. that I got in 1970. That, <laughs> that was my first look at stuff yeah. and I still want other people to have that opportunity um, because look how you know look how it ruined my life. <laughs> <laughs> well I see that beautiful picture behind you so you got something out of it. <laughs> Yeah, this is actually, that's actually my home. It makes it look like it's a little piece of heaven. It's not bad. We're, we're not far from you, you know, over in uh, Malibu Lake. Um, oh, okay. Yeah. You know, that near Paramount Ranch. And uh, this was yes. Jeff Dye, a uh, great photographer from China he was visiting. And, you know, these guys, you, I've traveled with astrophotographers before. And I go to bed and they go outside and then they come back in the morning. You know, it's just, you can't keep them in, inside. Uh, he took this photo and um, I've got a couple different photos from astrophotographers who have visited that I, in, a, my, in my real background here, I got a bunch of souvenirs from places, which, yeah, I got some stuff out of it. I mean, it's been good. It's been a lot of fun. That's beautiful. So I just want to take a minute to really acknowledge the folks that have come and watched the show with us. Daniel, David, Anthony, I know Scott's in here and thanks so much for your comments. Uh, if you wanted to, um, you know, talk about any one of them in particular, Michael will just put them back on the screen. So sure. yeah, we really appreciate though. Um, yeah. Positive and uplifting. Uh, David, yeah, I've been in, been in this business for a really, really long time. 
So uh, you said you extended your um, campaign. How long is that available for? And here's the link to it. I put it in the chat as well. Oh, great, How thanks. long do people have a chance to continue to donate to this? <laughs> well, it's extended for another 14 days. One of the reasons I did that, um, we had some fantastic people popped up and and we, as often happens as we're getting closer to the end and, and pushed us across the goal line. Nice. Um, but one of the things is I've been in a lot of shows lately, you know, getting this, it's a new organization. So uh, it's a startup, doesn't have the following like, like uh, other things that I've done before. So we're starting over. So yeah, I wanted to take advantage of the PR that we get and the great audiences because I know people do support this stuff. So, yeah, um, but I think, I think, you know, it, 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 there's been such a great response. I think we'll hit it over the next few days. And, yeah, and seems be, likely. Uh, and I remember when I looked at it, it was, it was about half of that. So bravo. Yeah, we had one amazing person who I wrote to. He, he donated anonymously and he gave $1,000. Um, and I've had a few others that I know in various communities who have done that. Also for Ast Astro uh, Astronomy for Equity. Um, because we have uh, operating expenses, even though they're minimal, but you know, you start from zero, you got to start doing it. That's just the startup pain. So, uh, yeah, I really oh, like, oh, oh yeah, that's the first one. Sorry. I, I flashed the second one, Dave. Sorry. Yeah. He's, uh, refurbishing telescopes that I think they're donated. Right. And then they're finding mostly local kids. Right. Yeah, to, and, to them too. and this is something so, you know, I started Astronomers Without Borders years ago and uh, and it was it's the same idea, except we're connecting people around the world for the first time through astronomy. Nobody really done that before. And that started with my trips to Iran and Iraq and connecting people through these countries. And, you know, lo and behold, they find out that people there are interested in the same things. They're just like us. Uh, forget the governments, they're, they're all nuts, but, yeah. you know. Well, and you, yeah, you have the added hardship of actually getting the scopes to them. You don't have a local source of telescopes. Yeah. This is the problem. So my plan initially, one of the few things that I thought we would do initially where it took off in all directions was to do exactly that because it, it, it's easy enough to find scopes that people don't want anymore. I mean, uh, in LA Astronomical Society and other things, we always had people that said, I don't want this scope anymore. If you come pick it up, uh, you can have it. And sometimes it's like some huge, gigantic thing. Yep. Or sometimes it's, you know, a big telescope that's back in the garage someplace and it turns out to be a water heater. But, you know, you never know what you're going to get. <laughs> and uh, so I've been through that a lot. But the problem is somebody gives you a scope, it's going to cost way more than the scope is worth to send it halfway around. And then it has to get through customs where often the people in customs think that, well, somebody's got this telescope, they must be rich. Oh, it's going to cost you a lot of money in customs. And it just goes into their pocket. And I've seen people, I've seen things held up for months that way. Um, so the logistics of it, we can do a lot of things virtually. The logistics of doing things in the real world is very different. So absolutely what Dave's doing is fantastic. Um, it's just hard to make it work overall. And uh, <clears throat> yeah, yeah, Dave, we're, we're well, self-funded doesn't mean I'm putting money in because I've done that long enough and my poor wife just doesn't think I should keep doing that anymore. I mean, I've always made the money back, but uh, yeah, we are looking for agencies and others. And I, I know a lot of people in the industry, so I'm talking to some of the bigger companies about getting support and so on. Um, yeah, so <clears throat> it, it, it's tough in that regard. Now, Dave also mentioned uh, autism. My wife's a special ed teacher. I understand oh. how this can be used as well. I, I think I've got a number of things puts me on the spectrum as well. It's a complicated thing, but, um, and yes, absolutely. Uh, 
there are many different ways that, that astronomy can be used. Um, in some ways, it's, you know, when you look at this, it's not connected to anything. It, it's just up there in the sky, but at the same time, it, it really is connected to everything. Astronomy has been a part of every culture throughout time. It's yeah. only the last 120 or 30 years that we don't all see a nice dark sky. We can um, all see the moon, though, and it's the same moon wherever you are. The same moon. Absolutely. Something just occurred to me is trying to figure out people who are shipping stuff to those countries. You know, shipments of something and then getting together with them to pack your telescopes with those shipments. Yeah. So <clears throat> I've been working on this problem a long time, really. <clears throat> and I've tried uh, contacting DHL and FedEx and UPS and so on. Mm. Um, the way we usually did it with the smaller scopes, like the uh, 114s that Dave was talking about, if we get something like that and we have somebody who is, for example, uh, just one I think of, we had a student uh, who, who was in an astronomy club in the Philippines. He said, well, we need a telescope. And, but he was in the U.S. for a while. So we got the telescope to him. From then on, it's up to him. And uh, they, they can, uh, you know, take it with them as excess baggage or something like that. Mm. But you just kind of have to sign off on it and say, you know, it's up to you from then on because... I've had things held up in Nepal and Tanzania and, and uh, other places. And <clears throat> so there needs to be a plan. But yeah, going with people who are going there anyway. I sent a, you know, I used to write for Sky and Tell. Mm. And we, were, we had uh, eclipse glasses um, mm -hmm. that we were sending mm -hmm. around the world. And so I contacted Kelly Beattie and he was leading an eclipse tour to Kenya. And he said, great. And we shipped a bunch of cases of glasses to different people on the tour and they took them along. But, you know, it's it's tough. So, Steve is asking about how much time is devoted to teaching astronomy in my country. Well, that's here in the US and the answer to that is pretty much nothing. Yeah. Uh, in other places, you know, it's interesting. They, they make assumptions about the US and they'll say, <coughs> Here we don't have astronomy in the schools. And I tell them we don't have astronomy in the schools either, you know, unless it's the less it's one science teacher that's into astronomy and he does it for the life. It doesn't happen. Um, what we do have is opportunities. So I'm talking to one, um, he was introduced me to me as a somebody he just described as a genius. And I, I think that's the case. He's a Refugee from Syria in Jordan. He's now out of the refugee camps and he's supporting his family and so on. Uh, he's learned advanced math and physics on his own with no college education. Wow. And he wants to get into college so he can, you know, really polish his skills and so on. Um, but where he's from, there, there just is very, very few opportunities. It's tough to do. Yeah, um, one of the things that I've thought about when, you know, Dave made the comment of um, refurbishing mm. telescopes that you've been uh, given, mm -hmm. that's, that's a great idea. I just have no room to do that. I, it, you know, it kind of seems like you're required to have some tools and a workshop space and a good network of finding the people that can use it i'm not it would be great to have some more information dave on how to how to do that and maybe it's a team effort maybe it's a you know let's get together a couple of weekends a month with someone who has a nice garage and some of us who can come and work on things clean them up i mean cleaning and you know tightening screws that should be pretty easy yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah i have nowhere to put stuff it's hey mike have you tried just shipping the parts Oh, to a telescope it might not get held up as much if it's like a box of parts rather than something that someone can. Idea. Yeah, maybe true. I, I I haven't tried that. I mean, the problem is if it goes by air, it's going to be by weight, so it doesn't make any difference if it's disassembled. It's still expensive. Yeah. Well, I, I was thinking of the customs area and the yeah. fact that they might you know disappear in customs. That that could be. You know, I've usually worked with people 
in the country, sometimes like there's a planetarium in Ghana and they know the customs people and, you know, mm. almost everywhere. It's like, if it's for education, it's okay. You let it through, but you can't yeah. convince them uh, or they don't want to listen, but you know, they have an arrangement there. Anything that comes in, they know there, if it's for them, it's, it's going to get through. Um, and it's different in every country. I kind of have to leave it up to them. I just, it's, it's you know every place is different mm -hmm. oh david mm -hmm. uh, replied he got 30. oh it sounds like he plays an ad okay no i i got 30 given in the first ad on facebook and the majority only needed a cleaning up okay well that's, that's really good yeah. <laughs> and so you place an ad on facebook okay good to know i didn't realize this and then what another ad to find people who could use them because yeah we we okay. had a program for a while and we finally said <clears throat> getting them to to where they were needed from our standpoint was just too hard too expensive but people if they wanted to donate something that was actually worth something we had a store that was um checking them out and then selling them and we get the the, the money from that but you know it's still it's uh, if you have volunteers doing it, it's free, but it's kind of not really free. You're taking people's time, you know. So you got to yeah. sort of balance things out and see what's the best way to do. What Dave's doing is fantastic. It, uh, uh, yeah, I think Cliff works on the size of the parcel uh, for an eight-inch telescope. It's the weight. These Libyan telescopes are going by sea. They don't care about the weight. They, those are uh, that's entirely by by size which is why it's cheaper. Yeah. So yeah, Dave says these came from people that uh, got unwanted gifts, the hobby have gone wrong. Very easy to do in astronomy because if you are sitting there and you can't see anything with it, um, I remember a woman came and I've had this telescope for a year. I haven't figured out how to see anything with it in 20 minutes. We got her up and rolling. We, we saw things That's fine. Right. And that, that'll last you the rest of your life. All right, uh, Dave yeah. has it. Yeah, and it, it happens also. We've had people who said, you know, I just got a 12-inch and I've got this 8-inch here and it's just not worth the time and effort to sell it. I can give it to you guys and get get a tax write-off. Ah. Uh, <clears throat> so, but it's a lot of work. It is. Uh -huh. um, what we're doing here now, uh, I would give a shout-out to Cloudbreak Optics there in Seattle. I know the people at uh, Skywatcher really well, and I called them up, and uh, they said, "Oh yeah, um, what you know? They don't do do things directly." And and this was during the supply chain issues, and they said, "Contact these guys up at Cloudbreak," and um, which is a great name for an astronomy store in Seattle, um, <laughs> perhaps. But yes, and uh, they they've been holding on to these things with a deposit for months. You know, all well, nobody can get them. So they're absolutely fabulous to work with. And a lot, I've worked with a lot of different companies, both manufacturers and porters um, in local stores and things over the years. And uh, everybody wants to grow the hobby and everybody's sympathetic. You know, people that are in astronomy for a living, it's not because of the big bucks, you know, it's just not the way to do it. Um, and they're passionate about it. Yeah. It's great. So it's not for the big bucks, okay? <laughs> no, it's. I've known people that started little astronomy companies, and sometimes they go bust, and sometimes they don't. And it's, uh, but they do it because they love it. Yeah, the local one here has cameras as well as telescopes, so that that may yeah. be a little bit better model. Which, which store? Uh, the Woodland Hills and Woodland oh, Hills. Yeah, Farah, I know. Oh, yeah. Very real well, and that's who is helping us there. Uh, that was my camera store before they they carried telescopes. Oh, but, I didn't realize it was the one, and then okay. Yeah, it was funny. It's it. I came into the store one time, and she knew I went to Iran, and she said, "Mike, you've got to see this. This is an article about astronomy in Iran in Sky and Telescope Magazine." And I said, "Yeah, I know. Did you look at the byline? I wrote it." So, <laughs> But she's, she's great. The people there are great. Uh, um, yeah. Yeah. Work with them a lot over the years. Right. Yeah. So uh, let's see. So, 
but the other thing is, you know, really want to focus on uh, the blind, visually impaired, and others that get nothing here. Um, so it's really not all about telescopes. There are a lot of ideas about different ways to do things. And yes, Cliff, uh, we've been working on a cloud filter for a long time. <laughs> That's what we need is a cloud filter. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, people that have been involved with Mount Wilson for several decades, Mount Wilson mm -hmm. Observatory, and people come up and they see these gigantic telescopes and they really, they think we might have a way of seeing things during the daytime or looking through the clouds or something. Um, we need some basic education on astronomy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, with all the interest in SpaceX and everything, it seems like that might get a bit better. I don't know. It it does. I'm also involved in the space community, actually. I'm on the board of the Overview Institute. The, the Frank White wrote The Overview Effect. Right. And <clears throat> I know a lot of people are just in a, it's kind of an informal roundtable thing. And I was chatting with one of the people there who's with Blue Origin. Um, one of the people who's a regular in it got chosen to go up into orbit on SpaceX on the Inspiration 4. Um, and this is another interesting thing. You know, the rest of the world doesn't see space exploration and, and astronomy as two different things. They're the same thing. I mean, we are exploring the universe with telescopes a lot farther than the Mars rovers go. Um, yep. But for the most part, most there are space agencies in, in African countries and so on. They have communication satellites or something like that. Um, but they just don't see going into space and looking at space as being two different things. And uh, the astronauts that I've met, you know, a lot of them were inspired in the first place by, uh, by astronomy. And then that's what got them looking up and thinking about it. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Oh, I just thought of something um, for the astronomy for the blind. Have you guys been using 3D printers to make um, essentially plates, you know? Yeah. Plates? Yeah, there's definitely 3D printing stuff that's going on. And that's how the things are all made now. Those planetarium domes originally were molded. Mm -hmm. So they're very expensive. Now you can 3D print them. And wow. <clears throat> with the molded things, the problem is not only they're expensive to make, then you had to ship them someplace. Now you give them the appropriate file and they print it out where they are. So uh, 3D, so uh, gal <laughs> yeah. 3D galaxies and other things, I've seen a lot of models like that. Mm -hmm. uh, Space Telescope does it, um, you know, from the Hubble images and mm -hmm. uh, now Jay West. Chandra does it with the X-ray ones but there are a lot of others that are doing these things as well they are a boom and you know here's the interesting thing sometimes always when i go to one of these places i learn something because it's different than here and i learn from them about what they're doing and get see ideas and it's really inspiring and these 3d models that you can feel and hold in your hands and stuff they're really good for sighted people too because we're looking at 2D images, but they have data that helps them to recreate it in 3D. Yep. Even if it's a guess, you get a better feel for, no pun intended, feel for what, what, what you're looking at here if you can see the thing in 3D. Uh -huh. Oh yeah, I can totally believe that. I mean, think about how we look at the moon, but if you can actually, you know, learn it by its contours, Yep. Well, I think you're just going to learn it so much better. Yeah. And, and just thinking of the, <laughs> That'd be um, cool. <laughs> you know, of the big rift on Mars, of just oh, yeah. having it, instead of seeing a picture of it, actually have it in your hands to see how big of a gash that actually is. Oh, and it's deep too. So deep. This, <laughs> this goes back to the experience of looking through a telescope for the first time. Mm -hmm. you know, <clears throat> seeing a picture of Paris is not like being in Paris. Uh, the experience, the direct experience is, and I know a lot of people are doing video astronomy for me, putting eye to glass and seeing it, looking at it yourself. That's the wow moment. And 
that changes everything. When you look through a telescope at the moon for the first time, uh, chances are you'll never see the moon the same again. Uh -huh. And you know, you should, I'm speaking to the choir here, but uh, the, you know, show them Jupiter or Saturn, and they usually step back once they, you convince them that it's real, which I've had trouble doing with some options. Yep. And then they step back and they look up there like, where is that? And it's right there. This is not, you know, you can do that with a faint fuzzy and, and uh -huh. you're not going to see it, really. but the planets are right there. Yep. Uh -huh. And then from then on, you have the opportunity to actually see them moving around the solar system with us. Yeah. Well, what an amazing I, thing. Yeah, when I first saw the moon through a scope, it was like you could actually see the 3D, you know, the 3D-ness of it um, and things standing out against each other instead of just this circle of varying shades of gray. <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah. Makes a big difference and you learn where to observe and how to do it. I got many years ago, I guess this was the big Mars mania opposition in 2003. <clears throat> I spent a few weeks up at Mount Wilson for a few different things because everybody wanted to be up there. And I was up there for one group that was up there for Mars, but we were using the 60 inch telescope. Oh, wow. Um, and Tom Hanks and his family were there. And this was not too long over, what was it called, From the Earth to the Moon or something like that. That series he did, amazing series. Uh -huh. Yeah. And then there he, he got to see it for real for the first time. And on a good night, Ed is 3D. I mean, there's no trickery. I mean, you really see it because there's so much detail. That's a great scope. I've, I've heard the 100 inches and is good. It depends. Because I have seen things through the 100 inch that are way better. But it can be more difficult for visual observing mm. for a number of reasons. And it used to be we used the coup de focus there, which is that one when you're down in a little room and then everybody's body heat goes right up through the polar axis where the light's coming through. And it's difficult. Uh. But I've been there on nights. Um, I was there one night when we had the Saturn Nebula and GC7009 in the eyepiece of 1500 power. It was, it filled half the field. Oh, wow. And it wasn't moving. Uh -huh. It didn't flicker. Mm. It just sat there most of the time. The so, Ring Nebula is nice through the 60 inch. I've seen that there. Oh, fantastic. When the scene is good, it's, uh, it's unbelievable. Well, I'm from Ohio, so I have very low standards of sky. <laughs> The worst night here is the best night there. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We're, we're again, we're very, very lucky. Yes. Uh -huh. Not like the poor people in Ohio. We need to help them out here. <laughs> you know what? It's 60 miles up. It's all great. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know what? University of uh, uh, Ohio University, uh, I know people there that are, they have a really robust, uh, astronomy program for the disabled they have a great program called astro access and this is wow. also with um uh, space exploration and they pick these amazing people who are disabled in some way like an artificial leg or blind or something else and they give them a, a lot of different experiences including the zero g flight uh -huh. and this is all sort of demonstrating they do a lot of science little studies on the flight too um, it, all a way of showing that, you know, space should be open to disabled people, too. We, we don't need to be sending fighter drugs all the time. Uh -huh. And that's one of the things SpaceX is, and others are showing. Is, uh, yeah. I used to say, astron you know, astronomy is the overview effect for the rest of you. You can see that we're all part of the same planet. It's, and I said, that's good for the rest of us. We won't make it to space. But you know what? I, I, it's not even possible now. I have friends that have gone. So yeah, it's amazing. Long and you know, it's it's kind of following a similar trajectory that the airplanes did. Remember the barnstormers and the and then they had the rich folks taking the rides. And what do we do now? In fact, I am flying to Ohio on November first, and it was so little money. Unbelievably mm -hmm. how. Unbelievable how how little it took to take a trip across the country. 
Yeah, it's, it's amazing. <laughs> that's the same analogy I use, Pam, because people say, well, it's all for rich people. It's a rich people's thing. Why are we wasting the money and ruining the planet on this? Well, I, you know, people complained about cars scaring the horses at first, too. Well, people um, complained about trains that no one could survive going 30, 30 miles an hour. Yeah. <laughs> oh, we got another comment. Let's see. Cliff, and thanks you, thanks so much for all your comments, everyone. All right, Universe Sandbox is fantastic. You can 3D anything in the universe and change anything, gravity, size of stars, anything. I do not know about that, Cliff. I had never heard of that either. That sounds we may, great. We may have to do a show about it. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. I would watch that because I never heard of that. No, I'm I have to check that out for the yeah. And you've you've it. told me you've said stuff I didn't know about either. So I'm gonna have to rewatch the show and go take notes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It, it kind of makes me want to do Universe Sandbox next week, but I don't think I can pull it together in a week, but maybe the week after. Well, you might yeah, want to well, take a look first. We'll have to check it out. <laughs> so Mike, anything else you wanna share with the with the group? Well, we do have, you know, I have lots of ideas. That's I always have more ideas than I can possibly pull off. Oh, yeah. Um, and there are other things. I've got a grant into the, uh, with a partner who makes, uh, I don't know if you guys know about this. I don't have mine here to show you. It's called ISS Above. Oh. And this is a little device that tells you when the space station is coming overhead. You know about this? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, there's Heavens Above. And then the NASA alert for yeah. kind of the brightest space station passes. But this is I, an actual device. It runs on a Raspberry Pi. Okay. And when it's set up, it flashes lights or and, and it shows you on your computer if you have it set up for that. And it tells you when ISS is coming over. But the thing about it is it's overhead all the time. It's just not during twilight or just after twilight when you can see it. Yep. So this shows you all of the passes and it also uh shows you a feed from the space station looking back down at earth oh, neat. so we've got a, a a thing in where he's got him in schools we're going to connect the schools together because that's my thing is connecting everybody together and they can watch the space station come over one classroom the other one doesn't see it yet and, you know, that is sort of pass it from one to another. That's about as good a demonstration of a round earth as you can get. Nice. Um, and uh, <laughs> Oh, good move, Cliff. His wife Great. looked through his telescope at Saturn. Yeah, I, I've <laughs> well, been to Cliff, some... Cliff, tell her the, yeah, a bigger one. She'll see it even better. Maybe she'll... <laughs> there you go. Get, get the wife in on the aperture fever part. Exactly. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. I, I think he's done that. I think that's why it keeps raining over yeah, maybe. In, in Australia. <laughs> Uh, and, and, and I love that fun. moment when we're at a star party and, you know, I have an astigmatism. I get as close as I can and I, I tell them, I says, I'm going to let you drive and here's how you focus it. And you absolutely know the moment when it comes into focus. They're like, whoa, I love mm -hmm. that moment when it's just like no they question. see, well, a lot of cases like Jupiter and the moon, Saturn and the rings. Have you guys seen you and, and all of your viewers need to see this if you have a short called a new way to view the moon i think it's called. oh okay so i'm gonna like pretend i'm looking at you and i'm gonna google it anyway that's fine so um, yeah and if you give me the link i can share it it's a new view of the moon and i usually go to and i, I had these guys in a program and uh, this, you got to see this because what we're talking about here in 50 years of doing this stuff, this is the first thing that I've ever seen that captures what we're talking about. Mm. It's brilliant. And I am going to thank you for the comment. Oh, here we go. Oh, there we are. It's there. Wait, I see the. Um, I put it in the, in the chat. Oh, in the chat. Oh, I got it. I got it. I got it. Uh, Oh, private chat. So let yes. me <laughs> let me copy it over. Private chat. Did I? Thank, thank you, Mike. We'll figure it out. Uh, and you know, Daniel, if you would like to nominate Mike next May, that's when we do our nominations for the award. Oh. For people in Queensland. <laughs> 
Okay, cool. All right, Jeff, you yeah. got it. I haven't been to Australia yet, but yeah, check out that. You you could share this with your viewers and I'll blow it. I've seen it every time I share that with somebody, say, hey, you want to watch it now? So I don't know how many times I've seen it, but it <laughs> it's brilliant. It really captures it. Oh, sounds great. Can't wait. Oh, we got another comment here. A waste of money. <laughs> Best body of Facebook University for every dollar spent on the space program. It returns seven to 14 back. And, you know, <laughs> I have done a little studying of that, David, and they're actually not certain what the return on investment into the space program is and there's i mean there's a wide range even wider than what you said from from nothing to thousands of dollars per dollar so yeah well, i don't know that we actually know what well you can't really there's a lot of hidden benefit in that you can't know yeah. what technologies what products came directly from space research or came from things that they had to figure out for space research and, you know, just the things that we learned from that led to so many different things. Yeah, not to mention the inspiration of the program yeah. as a whole. And I have a lot of thoughts on that, as, as, which won't surprise you at all. Um, <clears throat> but, yeah, I agree with Dave completely. There are so many ways. Um, it's not really about the dollars. One of the things is that when you explore or you do basic science research or something like that, you don't know what you don't know. That's why you're doing it. So you don't know what you're going to find out or what it's going to propel. Nope. And we but get we, surprised a lot. <laughs> yeah, we have been explorers throughout history. We're born explorers and scientists. You know, anybody's had a child, once they start crawling, they're experimenting with everything they can reach, uh, throwing it around. It's not just because they learn that it irritates you. It's because it's, uh, <clears throat> you know, it's, it's how you learn how things work. It's that's physics research there. So we kind of need to do that. And you know, the people who it, people will complain about NASA spending money going to space, and then they'll say, "Well, why isn't NASA doing better than SpaceX? Or why don't we have any space program now, even though we have dozens of spacecraft up there?" Because they <laughs> some people don't even know about the International Space Station that it exists. Um, but most of the things up there are to benefit us. Research on other planets helps us learn about our planet. Uh -huh. And the yeah. inspiration, but, you know, like, like uh, Jeff said. And, and here's another example <clears throat> directly from Facebook. I was running a program, and it was to help get telescopes to Tanzania, where they're also building an educational observatory that's now completed. And on Facebook, somebody said, I think they need food more than they need telescopes. And my reply was, they need engineers, they need scientists, they need people who are going to figure out how to get the food grown there. So we're not having to send food every time there's a famine or a flood or a disease or something like that. It's, they need science. And in most places, um, there isn't a lot of it, and astronomy is, I'm gradually more and more convinced every year that it is the way to introduce it. We should be doing more of it here, too. Uh, it, it's because, you know, it's not going to have as many bored students if you're doing astronomy. And yeah. <clears throat> so what can you do? Obviously, there's science, technology, everything in the cameras engineering, building telescopes, how they work, mathematics, there's plenty of that there. By astrobiology, astrosociology, there really isn't anything that we don't study through the stars in some way. And we've been doing it forever. I've seen things um, in the Middle East that are celestial symbols you would recognize that are thousands of years old. And they're on Steli, which is like a boundary marker, or on the walls at the uh, <laughs> palace or something like that. So, yeah, yeah I know in India, there's whole buildings devoted to, you know, tracking the sun and different things. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, um, Mantar Jantar or something like that. I can't remember. I've been, I've only been to the, the relatively small one in Delhi. Jantar um, Mantra, I think, is what I've read. Yeah. 
Yeah. I don't remember. I can't. I shouldn't even try to say something in Hindi because I'm not going to get it right. It's just fascinating. I mean, even the even the mounds in Ohio, they think, have something to do with, you know, the ancient people's interest and sure. connection to the stars. Well, in in our own um, Southwest, they found between cracks in the rocks, they found spirals, and those spirals can be used to track the sun of, through that crack. So there are oh, little, there are little, you know small solar observatories that were you know built i don't know how many how long ago um, yeah and what gets me sometimes is things like that people say well they couldn't possibly have known that because they don't have any science it had to have been aliens <laughs> and the thing is is if you follow the sun for a hundred years you're going to pretty much figure out how it works it's not that hard oh well, yeah yeah, yeah. And, and if you rely on the seasons for when to plant things, when to look for a certain game, then that's very important, important for you. Yeah. to you. Yes. Yeah, and you yeah. want to figure out how to track it. So let's see. Uh, the majority of our populations are insular. Kids in the next century will look back at our criticisms and pee themselves laughing. Yeah. Well, <laughs> um, unless the kids of the next century are busy <laughs> sitting there staring at their phones and not even talking to their neighbors. To this um, kid sitting next to him. I know, I know. Yeah, it's amazing yeah. how things change, Dave. <laughs> Ab absolutely true, Dave. One of the things we don't notice, I mean, I've done a lot of different things, and you kind of get used to the idea that most of them aren't going to work. I mean, it's a good idea, but you find out, like the shipping telescopes around the world, sound like a good idea. It didn't really work out that way. Maybe someday I'll crack that one, but so many different things are ideas. And it's just not going to work because this one problem. And then three years, five years later, somebody comes along and they have the key that fits that one. And okay, we can do this now. But you know, for the most part, it's it's really a, a lot of failure. And so we remember all the people who succeeded at these things. Yeah, we we got there are a lot more failures, but uh, but you know that's what that's how you learn. That's that's how you try things. Supposedly, I don't know if this is apocryphal, but somebody in I, uh, Edison's lab said we've tried 500 different materials for for a light bulb filament, and none of them have worked. We haven't gained anything. And he said, "Yeah, we have. We, we've learned 500 things that don't work. I mean, right. we won't try those." I find that hard to believe because they found out it was just simple carbon. But yeah, um, that's the idea. What are you referring to, Cliff? Hmm. All righty. Oh, scopes, I think. Oh, 11 telescopes? Oh, my goodness. Well, that's that crazy. that is a disease. There's no question about that. <laughs> that's why it's always raining there, Cliff. Cut that out. <laughs> that would do it. Yeah. <clears throat> 11, wow. Yep. All righty. So um, we'll keep watching for comments. And, Mike, if you have something else, we do have a couple little more segments in our show. So. Ahead, yeah, Jeff. well, I don't really, I mean, I would say, and you could share it if you wanted to, the um, astroforequity.org um, uh, is our website. You can go there. Um, in addition to the campaigns, we do need uh, donations if, if you've got any uh, viewers out there. The, the funny thing about donations like this is these comments are great. And, and that's really what inspires me is that people say, well, that's good. Keep doing it. <clears throat> and that's what donations are like. I, I one time got a donation for $1 from somebody like in Central Africa. And that was the most amazing thing. Because obviously he couldn't afford more, but he wanted to give that dollar. So that is encouragement. I mean, if I could get one person to give a thousand dollars or 10 people to give a hundred or a hundred to give ten dollars i'd choose the a hundred because that's a hundred people voting you know so so that's good so um but that's my pitch and that's not really what i'm here for but i have to do it it's my job is that it did we get it right that's it okay cool. but go and check it out because there are a lot more ideas on there it's gonna take a lot of time to get them Long time to get him going, and I've got a lot of other ideas that we'll eventually get to, hopefully soon. 
Ah, uh, okay. So uh, Dave says, appreciate your dedication. And he's good. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dave. It's, it's, it's good talking to you. Kindred spirit. Oh, cool. So eight inch job. So yep. Oh, outside the pub. Oh, wow. Man, you, you're going to have to share that video <clears throat> because Cliff and others will see themselves in that so much. Uh, that video I gave you the link to, and if for some reason you didn't get it, uh, let me know. Yeah, we got a program here called Astronomy Untapped, which combines two of my favorite yep. things. And I yeah, think I've heard a good. bunch of those. Different cities will host them. Yeah. This was the Vimeo.com one. You yeah, were yeah, it's also on YouTube. I just happened to. There you go. Oh man, you guys out there, it's it's like four minutes. And wow. unless you just put it on loop and watch it for a few hours, because <laughs> this shows everything we're trying to explain to people about what it's like. Oh, can't wait Brilliant. to see it. All right. So, like I said, we'll watch for comments. Let's. Uh, okay. Go ahead, Jeff. Here, you got the next segment. Yep. Some stellar events this week, October 14th through October 21st. October 15th, Mars and the Moon are in conjunction. October 17th, last quarter moon, and another Globe at Night project begins. Oh, I got a link for that, too. No, I don't. <laughs> um, just Google Globe at Night. Globe um, at Night. Yeah, I'm, I'm on the board of ID. Oh, there it is. <laughs> yeah, she found it. Um, <laughs> there you go. That's yeah, awesome. For, yeah, for 10 days, October 17th through 26th, go out um, and observe um, Pegasus in the north and Grus or Grus in the south. Mike, do you know the pronunciation of that one? Uh, it probably better ask Cliff, but uh, yeah. <laughs> because he sees it. But I think it's Grus. Grus. But I, I have no idea. I yeah. Hey, Cliff, do you pronounce it like us, as in we, or Grus, as in, um, as <laughs> in the root. goose? Yeah. <laughs> um, um, compare what you see to the charts and report. To the site and that'll help them find out what the um what the viewing is in your area how dark the skies are right yeah I, i'm gonna <laughs> pop in here and give a little promo for that because i've known the people who do this since they started it and i'm uh, on the board of ida too but that's completely separate that's right. and this oh, is yeah. more than just a little thing to do that that this data is really important and people think that <clears throat> all the pictures from the satellites and stuff can be used for uh, seeing how uh, light pollution progresses and so on. Mostly not true. They don't take it in the right wavelengths. The oh. astronauts take pictures with the regular digital camera. Those are good, but there's a whole other problem with that, classifying what they are and everything. Globe at night is really important, and you really are contributing to science there. And there yeah, needs to be more people. It's a real it. citizen science project, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. That's what I figured. Okay. Thank you, Mike. I really appreciate that. I, we've done a whole show on it before, and we announce them every time during this segment of our show. Uh, but to hear what you said, that was fantastic. Thank you for yeah. your help. Appreciate yeah. that. It's not play. It's it's important. And everybody fills in a space that nobody else has done. Mm -hmm. so. That makes sense. Yeah, because there's more people on the ground in the general public than astronomers and <laughs> all of that. Okay, on October 19th, weekly space hangout with Pam. I'll be on that one. Um, <laughs> I'm one of the journalists, though. I'm not a guest. Yeah. Nicer maps a neutron star with Zavin, a Sermanian, and Keith Gendro. And you know, the first time I read this, I was, instead of nicer maps a neutron star, I've seen nicer, <laughs> nicer maps, maps. I did too. As in, what were the maps like before? But nicer must be a spacecraft, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, October 21st, our Friday night show, and it'll be another citizen science project. Excuse me. <coughs> Find us again Fridays at 9 p.m. Pacific time on the Everyday Spacer Facebook page and the Everyday Spacer YouTube channel. And if you're local to the area, the Ventura County Astronomical Society has a speaker meeting at the forum uh, it's Moore Park College in Moore, Cal Moore Park, California. That's Friday, October the 21st again. All right. So we do talk about some other events and activities. Uh, late August, last August, Joaquin, who was our first student,
guest mentioned some nice competitions for students. The Regeneron Science Talent Search Open. Uh, let me find that link. Is this it? Yeah, I think that's it. Um, and these students can win like $250,000 with these competitions. And uh, let's see, we've got, uh, there's four of them. There's a Science Talent Search, International Science and Engineering Fair, Broadcom Masters and Affiliated Fair Network. And, you know, Mike, some of these are eligible to students worldwide. So if you want to oh. know about that, we can talk. We can talk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me know about that. Awesome. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so let's see. Yeah, societyforscience.org. Is that, is that up there? Yes. Yeah. Um, and uh, Space Prize has a speaker series. I did hear from Mark Wagner, who said that they're not generating new shows. However, they do have an archive of shows. So go ahead and check those out. Also, the Space Education Symposium is November the 12th. This is a free online event hosted by the Human Space Program. That's a, Mar a Frank White thing. And, uh, yep, there's a link for that. Thanks so much. The fourth round of Nominate, a student with perseverance, started October 3rd, goes through the 31st. This is for 6th through 8th grade students in the United States. That's public, private, and homeschooled. They are eligible, and there's some pretty cool awards with that one. Yep. If you or someone you know has done something interesting involving space exploration, science, or astronomy, we'd love to share our live. Join us again next Friday night, October 21st. Deep Sea Explorers, the largest submarine neutrino telescope. Sounds so cool. <laughs> Thanks, Mike, for, for being here. We really appreciate you coming back. If you have more news at some point, absolutely let us know. We will have you as a guest again. Thanks Thank for you. having me back again. We, get, well, we have a whole series. This was Mike Sim the return of Mike Simmons. So next time will be the son of Mike Simmons and something like that. <laughs> Mike Simmons strikes again. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Thanks to our audience too, Cliff and Dave. And I know Anthony was here and Scott, thank you so much. Uh, did I Daniel. miss anybody? Daniel was here. All right, we, we really love our audience and we really want to um, show you some fun stuff you can do too. All right, so with that, we will say good night. Have a great week, folks. Bye -bye.